Good afternoon, 10B5. This is Miss Lawson bringing you your very much anticipated uh, final instalment of Inspector Calls. It's not going to be the final instalment forever. It's just going to be until we get back to school. Next week, we're going to be looking at poetry. Um, this is going to be a slightly longer lesson because we do have quite a fair bit to cover. Um, so take your time, find half an hour chunks maybe to do it. Um, ideally, you would have the whole hour and a half to be able to do your, to your learning, but obviously Times are tricky, so just work through it slowly. Um, strap yourselves in. I've got you. Um, there's no issues of worrying. If you come across something today you don't understand, it's fine. We will come back to it again. I'm not expecting you to understand everything that I cover today. Okay, so let's start as usual with our lovely do now task. Um, ideally, this would have been taking place in class with um, some actual cutouts. Um, these are dominoes. Okay, they're not dominoes, but they're pictures in the format of dominoes, and it's basically linking. Because AI likes pictures, as you know, to retrieve information. Um, but it's the domino effect. It's how someone has an effect on someone else and then someone else and then someone else. Okay, And it links to that whole chain of events that Inspector Paul talks about. And we're going to look at that uh, quote in a second. So what I'd like you to do, you either have a printer. Not many people if you do, and that's absolutely fine. Or you can spend time to draw a little stick men. Um, if not, if you're really not feeling that bored, you can just simply write their names okay so how does the inspector call goal sorry have an effect on mr burning and then how does mr burning have an effect on mrs burning you can do it both ways if you wish um when you any of the inspector was introduced into the dining room by edna um immediately mr burning gets his back up doesn't he and he uh tries to um kind of show that he's top dog and he's alpha male onto the inspector he doesn't, um, you know, he doesn't recognise him. He questions whether he's new. He states he's being an alderman and he's being a ta town mayor and he's still on the bench, blah, blah, blah. I mean, Mr. Burning really tries to, to stamp his authority over the inspector. The inspector's uh, character doesn't really change overly throughout the play. He's, he's very static. He's there for a reason. Priestley has written him to be static for a reason. Um, so you could just write one sentence here. Mr. Burning perhaps feels threatened by the inspector and shows tries to show his dominance um, by mentioning um, his accomplishments. Um, next one, Mr. Burning and Mrs. Burning. Interesting how uh, females of the party are sent to another room. Certain parts of the play because it's deemed not acceptable for women to hear such things. Alternatively, you could talk about Act Three and how Mr. Burning sticks up for Mrs. Burning in the face of Eric um, and what's going on. Um, so you can just have one sentence, simple, between there. See how many you can get round all the way through. Uh, it's a 10-minute task. It's slightly longer today. But just have um, a little play around. Think about it. Retrieve that information. How do they each have an effect on one another? Okay, so part of your homework task last week was to look at the inspector's final speech, but specifically these two quotes. Um, but just remember this. OK, so that is a nice short quote. And you think it's quite simple. It's actually it is quite simple, but it's quite useful. OK, so the language here isn't what we call imperative language. It expresses a command um, rather than a question. It's a bit like when I say to my children, eat your spinach. OK, I'm not asking them to eat their spinach. I'm telling them to eat their spinach um, as if I'd be that mean. So he's saying, but just remember this. By putting verbs in the beginning of a sentence, it usually changes things into a command um, rather than a statement or a question. Um, and also, he's remember he's instructing to remember. And he's not saying remember, you know, myself being here and interrogating you. He's saying remember Eva, the Eva Smiths. Remember your actions. Remember what you've done. And remember the people uh, that are still out there like Eva Smith. He's not talking to the family. Remember him when he is, but he's not. He's talking to the audience of 1945 priestlies using those characters like vehicles to show the audience something and he wants the audience also to take on board um, what the family have learnt. Remembering a life lesson, so to speak. Now the next quote, it's the simplified shortened down version, one Eva Smith has gone but um, the whole quote here, if you have a look at it, uh, one Eva Smith has gone but there are millions and millions and millions of Eva Smiths and John Smith still left with us. Okay, that was what I asked you to look at. Um, it's interesting, there's different varying degrees of answers that you could have for this. I know some of you have sent work in and you're struggling with this, this section. It's okay, just add to it what I'm adding now for you. Um, why did Priestley choose the word Smith or the name Smith? Well, it's A, if you really want an int intricate answer, you know, Smith, um, like a blacksmith, refers to a worker in metal. If you think about the Industrial Revolution of the time, 
um, of when the play was set. It's quite interesting. But actually, if you think about Smith as just being a really generic name, it's just a really common name. It tends to be belong to the working classes. Um, and he's not, he, you know, if it had been something a far more far-fetched as a, a surname, it wouldn't have had the same impact um, as, as Smith. Okay, Because the inspector is trying to tell the audience and the family that actually, you know, we need to remember everyone out there of the working classes. Why did he choose Eva? Again, it is a reference to um, a, a biblical reference, and I'm going to get through that in a second about the Bible. It's quite interesting. Um, this is your more in-depth answer, a bit more of your silver or your gold star answer. Is Eve, obviously, um, was the first woman in the Garden of Eden. Think about the audience, 1945, what they've just gone through. Why would the Bible be really, really useful? Um, and what you know, think about the religious beliefs of the time of England and other countries. Um, so, yeah, Eve, Eva, closely linked, symbolising all women. Now, John Smith did not drink disinfectant, OK? So you're thinking, well, why is he mentioning John? Well, of course, John is, again, another common British name. But he, what he's saying is it doesn't, it's irrespective of the fact that Eva was female. He wants us to remember everyone within the working classes, male, female, children and so on. So the fact that John and Smith, very, very common, he's wanting the audience to remember uh, and think about um you know, the working class and the implications and the impact that the higher class people, the people that have the privilege and the money and the entitlement and the status, just to think about and act more socially responsible. Remember, Priestley, his takes on, on society, socialist background, he really wants everyone to be looking after one another. He's also used repetition of millions three times. Um, remember, the rule of three, we've talked about that. Lots of you have covered that uh, really well in your answer, your year 10 assessment, um, to the letter to the editor. You might be thinking letter, speech, different. No, they, yeah, exactly, they have to be exactly the same. You're using the same rhetoric devices, the same um, points of um, conversion um, and convincing someone um, to your point of view. So he's used the rule of three here, millions, and millions obviously, again, is a really interesting word he's used. He's really ramming that home that everyone has to take responsibility for people in the world and not just for themselves, which again is in complete opposite to how Mr. Burling starts off the play talking about all the hive, the bees in the hive and you know everyone must, everyone must look out for themselves. Um, we can go into far more detail with that if we wanted to, but if you haven't managed to get some of that, just stop the, the video, pause it, add to it. Um, if you have your text, for instance, you can obviously highlight and annotate on your text with post-it notes or highlighters if you've got them, or you just simply make a note of them. Okay, so this is the original um, inspector's speech that we need to be looking at. Um, there's lots of devices in here that we've covered. So we, obviously your letter had to include the forest techniques. One of those things as well that some of you really struggled to utilise and use was your sentence structure. Okay, It's something so important. Sentence structure is vital in, in really ramming home and convincing someone your argument. If you have those kind of more longer, windy sentences, you can include more information. That's perhaps where you could put the rule of three, for instance, which we'll come back to in a second. However, those short, punchy sentences are vital. Okay, they're so useful, so simple. If you wanted to talk about sentence structure just from this um, speech alone, you'd have at least a good paragraph of something to write about. So always consider, as soon as you start seeing something new or something that you've already studied before, think word choice sentence structure and imagery. Uh, word choice is really crucial. You're really good at that, actually. You chose some really fantastic words fit for purpose. But sentence structure this is something you really need to look at. So have a look. We don't live alone. Full stop. We are members of one body. We are responsible for each other. It's okay, got nice, short, punchy sentences. And then the last one, he says, and I tell you that the time will soon come when if men will not learn that lesson, then they will be taught it in fire and blood and anguish. Full stop. Good night. Okay, really lovely. You can talk about the sentence structure um, to, to your little heart's content, really. It's fantastic how he's using the short sentences. And I say he, Priestley, he's really just essentially copying what's been around for um, donkey's years. And I'm going to look actually at um, a piece of... Um, uh, text from the Bible, which is quite interesting to show how, you know, actually this isn't going on for years. It's not something that the English department have made up for you to do or the exam board. Uh, it's something that's really convincing. If you wanted to write a letter perhaps to your parents to convince them 
For something you perhaps take on board these devices, these rhetoric devices to really convince uh, your listener. Um, interestingly, almost kind of 80 years on, we've got the lovely Mr. Barack Obama here, and this is his inaugural speech when he's accepting. Have a look at the contrast between this and the inspector's speech. It's really interesting to have a look at. Firstly, um, let's just go back for one second. We have got um, the word we, 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 okay? What does the word we, what does it kind of give us? If you think about having a look at Barracks, um, Mr. Obama, don't know him firstly, word for Mr. Obama, R, R, and R, okay? It's that inclusive language, it's that first person plural pronouns, it's that provides that commonality, that union between everyone. Yes, he was the President of the United States, but he wanted everyone in America to really take on board what he was saying. He wanted to unify the whole country. Now, if I wanted to say to you, our Microsoft Teams, that is where we will produce our work. It just gives us that idea, that commonality that we're all in it together. Okay, and that's exactly how I do feel. I do feel that's our team. That's where we will all contribute and put our work on. So have a think about that, that type of language. Also, where's his short sentences? Where's his rule of three? You can see it clearly here. Homes have been lost. One, job shed. Two, businesses shuttered. Three, okay? If you go back to Priestley's, I'm not going to give you the answer because that's part of your question for the day. But you can see the rule of three. Really, really lovely. Um, you've got the different sentence structures here. Our healthcare is too costly. Our schools fail too many. And each day brings further evidence that the ways we use energy strengthen our adversaries and threaten our planet. Lovely word choices here. So where can you see the word choices? Badly weakened, consequence, greed, irresponsibility. Where can you see it in Priestley's um, final speech for the inspector? Okay, the answers are going to be coming uh, eventually, but you're going to provide um, the main, main of the answers for me. Um, now, there are going to be new techniques uh, found in this. They're also found in this. They're also found in other places. Don't panic if you have seen, never seen these before. Okay, I've got you. I'm here. I'm going to explain it as best as I can. And even at the end of this lesson, you're still not sure you're going to have plenty of time. Let's take a deep breath. Strap yourselves in. Write down these three subheadings for me. And if I taught you in year nine last year, you all know anatoposis. I love a bit of anatoposis. I love how all of these three words just roll off the tongue anyway, as being a bit of an English geek, as you well know. But write these three down and the definition. And I'm going to try to go through and explain how they are and what they are. So anaphora, just say anaphora. Say anaphora out loud for me. Brilliant. The repetition of a word or phrase at the beginning of successive clauses or sentences. So clause part of a sentence or a whole sentence and successive means following on. Okay. So the repetition of a word or phrase at the beginning of successive clauses. Anadiplosis, the repetition of a prominent word um, or phrase or clause at the beginning of the next. So it's the last word or phrase and then you start the next sentence with the same word or phrase in the next sentence. And I'm going to give you an example in a second. Polysyndetum, the repetition of conjunctions in close succession. So conjunctions, words that connect. Okay. In this instance here, we've got the word and. So as in, we have ships and men and money. Now, if we were to take this out here, which is how you normally would have written it, put a comma here, to take that conjunction out, we have ships, comma, men and money. That's how you would normally write it, but there he hasn't, um, well, this person hasn't, he's using polysyndeton, so he's connecting these parts of this sentence using many conjunctions, repetition of the same conjunction. There is an opposite to this. There is an opposite. If I was to take out this and here, I'm not going to confuse you, but it does exist, and maybe we'll come to that um, later on. But no, polysynthesis is where you have the repetition of the same conjunction. Okay, so andoplosis. This is not seen in the final speech. Okay, it's in Act 1. It's in this quote here. Okay, because what happened to her then may have determined what happened to her afterwards. And what happened to her afterwards may have driven her to suicide. It's a chain of events. Okay, so I mentioned that this morning. Um, sorry, this afternoon about the um, the domino effect. So this is the the word or phrase that's been repeated. This instance is a whole phrase. 
what happened to her afterwards. This is this is the first part of the sentence, it's the first clause of your sentence. And he's taken it, Prisha's has taken it and used it at the beginning of the next. For what happened to her afterwards and what happened to her afterwards. Again, you're just creating the emphasis, okay? One simpler, really clear way he can see it. It's our little green man down here. I know Yoda didn't write his own script. Um, on the top of my head, I can't remember who wrote. Uh, was it Spielberg? I'm not entirely sure. But we can see here, fear leads to anger, full stop. Anger leads to hate, full stop. And hate leads to suffering. He's actually used um, a multiple um, of uh, examples of amateur places. He's finished this instance is a word. This is a whole phrase. It's still repetition. He's used the repetition of anger here. He's finished it here. And he starts the next sentence with anger. He's finished this sentence with hate. And he started the next sentence with hate. So it's a really clear example of antiplosis. Again, only in that quote. Not going to be in your final one to kind of look at. The two that are anaphora and polysyndeton. What I would like you to do for a second. Have a look at the definition. Pause this video. And see if you can write two sentences. One sentence for this one. About anything absolutely anything and second one you can write a sentence for this and see if you can try to incorporate those into your two sentences take five minutes give it a go just do it in um in note form if you wish if you get it wrong get it wrong it's not a problem two minutes and we'll do it together okay so if i were writing a sentence which contained anaphora oh let's think about it i would write i would like Now, because um, that's my main clause, I'm going to have to start my next clause with exactly the same. Okay, I would like a holiday to Bali because I am exhausted. And again, another I need, for Anna, I need to start the next sentence, the next clause, with exactly the same again. So I would like a holiday to Bali um, as uh, I am a little bored in my house. Okay, bored, I know I'm bored, I'm safe as well. Put that in there, I'm just having a little play around with you, okay? So hopefully you come up with a little sentence or two, or three maybe, so just containing anaphora. The only way to learn this is to practice it. So give it a go. Send a picture of it when you've done it and send it to me. Polysyndetum is where you've got the conjunctions. Um, I'm probably giving you way too much information into my private life. I'm going to say I would like a piece of cake. Why are we doing that? Make it there. And because I am using polysyndetum, I'm going to go and a glass of wine and a hot bath and a holiday to Bali. Someone still has not paid for me to go to Bali. So we're looking at the polysyndetum, we're looking at the conjunction and <coughs> and and it's quite interesting actually um, when you've been taught so long to not do that it's quite hard to write a sentence and not put a comma in but give it a go see what you can come up with like i said the only way for you to understand this is to be able to do your own okay so here we are we're looking at the rhetorical tropes or the devices we need to find them. You need to be little detectives for me. This, I say here, is pause. This is going to take you, I would imagine, 20 minutes minimum. Now, I say minimum. This is your very basic uh, expectation. Okay, these three. Emotive vocabulary, inclusive language, rhythm and sentence structures. Okay, we've covered all of it. This is all looking at the final inspector's message. Okay. Now, if you really want to push yourself... I have two further um, levels for you to do. I've got the silver award and the gold. The silver, I would like you to look at the contrasting words or phrases, which is called juxtaposition. It's the opposite. Where can you find a word that's in complete opposite to another? You need to give me, um, in your chart, you need to give me the quote or the evidence. Okay. And then, like always, the analysis why. So if I say, if we go back to the actual um, speech, hopefully you've got your PDF looking at motive language, uh, vocabulary. Okay. 
So let's have a look. Emotive vocabulary, hopes and fears, or fears. Let's do fears. And we would put that into a little chart here. And then why? Why is he trying to highlight to the to the audience and to ourselves? Um, why is Priestley trying to show us? You must know. What's he trying to show? It's done. We've done this over and over again. But why is he choosing the word fear? Inclusive language. Again, there's loads of examples. We have covered that so far. And the sentence structure. Again, we've covered that so far. Okay, so those answers. I would like all of you to do those three for me, please. Quote evidence with analysis. Feeling brave. Juxtaposition. The opposites. And then the rule of three. Okay. Now, if you're feeling really brave, and I would really, I'm giving out extra R points at the moment. Um, <clears throat> for those of you that are sending me your work, hopefully you will upload them to Teams when that's up and running. Um, I would like you to find examples of polysyndeton and anaphora. Please don't panic if you can't do it. Okay, there is no punishment. There's nothing going to come back at you. I just would like you to give it a go. If you send me a picture and you go, Miss, I've done the gold, I'll be like, fantastic, well done. If you say, Miss, I've done the silver, I'll be like, fantastic, well done. I'm not going to, um, you know, um, be stroppy if you haven't, but I'd just like you to try, okay? So that's going to take you a minute or 20 minutes. Pause this video, make the chart, and see what you can find. Okay, um, what we need to do here, um, we are looking at this... Um, Sorry, wrong slide. We're looking at uh, the reasons why we think the policeman is not necessarily who he says he is. OK, so imagine once he's left, obviously we have that whole dialogue between the family trying to work out exactly what or who the inspector was. Just ask yourself this question. Don't need to write it down. Um, how is the inspector different to our own expectations of an ordinary, ordinary policeman? It's quite hard to make that judgment now in 2020 because obviously it was set um, in 1912, but obviously shown to 1945. But still, there are still little clues there that perhaps he wasn't who he says he was. Now, um, the inspector uses um, kind of imagery based around the Bible. It's not the inspector. Um, it isn't. It's it's Priestley. Priestley obviously had this whole socialist background who really believes in society and looking out for one another okay but where did he get his ideas from where do we see that kind of language those devices well the bible of course um think about 1945 think about what the audience has been through i've just gone through this awful uh, world war the second of actually that generation remember lots of those will remember the first um, and how important religion uh, was in, those, in that society. I mean, it's still quite important to some of us now, but nowhere near as much as it was then. OK, and if you have a look at this and you look at the actual final inspector speech, again, this is an answer. It's, it's you know, the top end answer. So you don't worry if you're not understanding it. But just have a have a, a read through with me. Just as a body, though, one has many parts, but all its many parts from one body. So it is with Christ. Okay. Where have we heard similar sentences and, and words? For where for we were all baptised by one spirit as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slave or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. And even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. The eye cannot say to the hand, I don't need you. And the head cannot say to the feet, I don't need you. And on the contrary, these parts of the body that seem to be weaker are indispensable. OK, so this is a commentary on society. It's about how everyone has to work together. It's about the head working with the feet, i.e. the people in charge and the people that are lower down in the class system. It's saying that they have to work together because actually if they don't work together, they are weaker. Um, and there is not one part of the body uh, are, you know, having to work together. Um, if you have a look at the language just as a body, has many parts um, and he's relating it to Christ. Um, have a think, pause this video, see what you think, if you can see any religious links to the inspector's, uh, sorry, inspector's final speech. Right, let's just summarise. Um, I know this is going to go quite quickly. Like I said, we will go through this again at some point. So the inspector has said his speech, you've analysed it, you've worked out whether it's useful, whether it was you know, what he was trying to get out of it. Um, so now he's left, and the Burling family are now staring, subdues, and wondering. Mr. Burling's first reaction is to verbally attack Eric, 
blaming him for all that's happened. Okay, so not himself, Eric, his poor son, and he's not thinking about Eva yet again. He's still shifting blame and he's still thinking about the scandal and the loss of knighthood. When Eric laughingly dismisses this, so he's laughing at basically Mr. Burling, Mr. Burling cannot come back with anything, okay, because he knows what his son is, well, he doesn't know his son, his son is saying is true, but his son has a really good, valid point. He's like, you are ridiculous, like, you should be thinking about uh, bigger things than, than your knighthood. And all Mr. Burling can come and do is what he always does is relate everything to money, and he tells him he must repay the money he stole. So it's again about money, it's about uh, shifting the blame. Um, Mrs. Burling tells Eric that she's ashamed of him, okay, and Eric says actually he's ashamed of both of them okay so eric has taken on the inspector's key messages as has sheila okay look at that generational divide between the two um sheila reflects on the inspector's arrival um however um we're going to come to that in a second how it disintegrates yet again um so uh, there's a last brief part of the play where Sh Sheila and Eric are essentially beginning to run the show just for a very short space of time and they are actually very angry at their parents and they stick up for each other and together and Eric agrees with Sheila commenting that the inspector was our inspector um again the doorbell rings um and Gerald Croft enters the room remember he's left and what's he been doing well he's come to tell us that um, he basically came across a policeman outside, or he's I found someone. There's a quote here. I met a police sergeant. I know down the road. I asked him about the inspectacle. So now, the brief little respite here of um, of you know them taking personal and social responsibility for their actions is now unravelled yet again. Gerald's come in. He's like mediating. He's like the um, the person that flits between the two generations, really. And he's been out to try and work out what's going on. So he's found this police sergeant and he swore there wasn't an inspector or anyone like him on the force here. So Gerald's saying, I, I just don't believe this inspector. OK. Sheila makes that really lovely comment as well. We inspected us all right. OK, we're going to come back to that in a second or something along that line. Gerald counteracts, well, we've no proof it was the same photograph and there was no proof it was the same girl. So again, really discounting not only that the inspector is real, but actually it might not even just be the same person. Burning, well, somebody put that fellow up to coming here and hoaxing us and there are people in this town who just like me enough to do that. He's making it about himself, guys. Okay, yet again, he's still not taking it on board. He's not thinking about his actions. And then he's also making it about himself and saying, well, people just don't like me and that's why they've done it. Uh, nobody's been brought in after drinking disinfectant. Okay, so this is when Mr. Burling has picked up the phone and he's saying, right, we're, we're going to work out what's actually happened. Let's phone and let's see what's happened. And he finds out that they, just, they haven't had a suicide for months. Okay, so it calls him to question everything. And then, so just when you, as an audience member, you're thinking, goodness gracious, I mean, I thought, you know, this seemed a bit, a bit strange. We get a phone call. That was the police. A girl has just died on her way to the infirmary after swallowing some disinfectant and a police inspector is on his way here. So an, an audience member, wow, we've come back full circle, only this time, slightly different. The inspector turns up out of the blue, okay? We didn't get any prior warning. They were enjoying their meal. Edna uh, introduced the inspector. This time there's an, an official phone call, okay? So it does feel like that. Actually, perhaps this is a real scenario. We never get to find out, obviously, but actually it says um, the fact that it's a phone call is very, very different. And a police inspector is on his way here. So as an audience, you're thinking, wow, we're going to go all the way around the way through the houses again. Why is that? Is it because they didn't learn their lessons the first time? Perhaps the uh, inspector goal was, um, you know, a warning. And had they changed their mind, this would not be happening. Or it was just, you know, a lovely kind of cyclical structure of the play who knows um that is what you need to investigate um right now for me so please try to find this in your books for me into your textbooks your pdf there are uh, five things i'd like you to research okay so this and your chart okay there were the things two things you need to produce from today's lesson um if you can't do all five try to do as many as you can but they should be nice and simple bearing in mind they are on this slide here please don't go back it was a hope to humiliate the family you need to go back and find a quote um, that would back that uh, information up 
ghoul is a supernatural being or a time traveller. Slightly um, harder to do than, than the others, actually, but it is doable. Find me a quote to back that up for me, please. Number three, ghoul is not a genuine police inspector. Four, irrespective of his identity, the most important function of the inspector is his role as a moral teacher. Again, you can find a couple of quotes that would show us that, actually. And five, the photographs were of different women. I've just given you the answers to those. Write all the boxes down, please. There's no point just writing the five quotes because they are, without the context of why you're writing them down, they don't, really don't mean very much. So write this and then the quote below them. That and your chart looking at those devices, hopefully you'll have a firmer grip on um, on the play. Um, there is a final extension task. Should you want to, this is, um, this is optional. I'm actually going to write here optional. Um, if you want a little bit further work, what does it mean? Eric says he was our police inspector, all right. Okay, I love that line. <clears throat> I would like you to tell me. You don't have to explode it if you don't want to. Just talk about it. Two to three sentences. Uh, what do you think this means and how does it make the audience feel? Hopefully, you haven't been rushed through too much. Hopefully, you are understanding those two new t literary terms or three terms today. If not, I am available by email, so you can always ask. Um, secondly, hopefully we're going to have our Microsoft Teams up and running soon um, where we can all get on there and have a chat and I can upload um, this and any other information or worksheets or resources that you might need. Hopefully that's sorted uh, by the time you're watching this and when it is I will send you an email. Um, and Other than that, I hope you have a lovely week um, and you all stay safe and I look forward to speaking to you next week. Thank you so much for all of you that are sending me your work and working really hard. I really appreciate it. You will thank yourselves. I know it's tricky. I know it's hard. You will thank yourselves for this when you get back to school because you will be where you need to be. Um, and likewise, if you can't, it's fine. We will solve it when we get there. Have a lovely week. Take care.